Hello, this is National Master Spencer Feingold back at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta with another Endgame Lecture. Today we're going to focus mostly on tactics. And just fair warning, uh, because it's you know about tactics, there are going to be a few more pieces on the board than, than the typical Endgame. But a couple of the examples are just uh, one or two pieces each, like a traditional Endgame. So, uh, you know, you Endgame purist, I'm sorry, you know, what, what can I do? There's only so much I can do. Uh, I have five examples for you, and usually I don't get through them all, but I'll, I'll do my best. But I like to ask some questions, especially when it's tactics related. So I could definitely imagine, uh, you know, getting through only three or four examples. Um, but all right, so here we have this position. Hopefully you can see it, uh, this chessboard that I shared in the Zoom lecture. And it's this is a position that I show to well, it's actually from, it, this is analysis from a game, uh, Gaylashvili against Golden, that I found, I think it was Agard's analysis, y Jakob Agard. So if it wasn't him and it was somebody else, I'm sorry. If it you know, was him, then there, I gave him his, his kudos, his credit. But anyways, I thought this was really interesting. It was an interesting game. And this is just the end of the analysis because, like I said, it's an in-game lecture. And, okay, it's black to play right now because his rook's attacked and his knight's attacked, right? Uh, this actually, this position didn't happen in the game. Like I said, it's just analysis from this game uh, that could have could have theoretically happened, you know. But uh, anyways, black would, in this position, play rook d8 because his rook and knight are both hanging. But I was hoping uh, in the Zoom call here, one of the many participants, if they could uh, find some tactical opportunities for white. Uh, so white to play, maybe you can, if you want, you can just shout out some candidate moves. Um, you don't have to, though, you know, if you want to think it through a little bit more. But candidate moves would be a good way to start. Try to find some forcing candidate moves for white. Hmm. Yeah, so... We could think about, for example, our checks, but we only have one check, right? On g7. Doesn't look too tempting, huh? Doesn't look too, it's also a capture. We have another capture, right, on d5. Yeah, it doesn't look too great either, does it? So we're going to have to find that. Those are the third kind of forcing move, right? Threats. Checks, captures, and threats. So how can white make some threats? Anybody has a, have an idea here? Yeah. Well, tell me about it. Uh, bishop e4. Bishop e4. That's a threat. Certainly. Definitely a candidate move. Threatening the knight. Now, the knight's not uh, really pinned, is it? It kind of looks pinned, but we have the rook defended on c6. Uh, with the knight on c6, I mean. But, okay, that's a candidate move, though. Probably he would, you know, do, like, move the knight or move the other knight to defend. Maybe some, maybe some other threats? What else could, uh, could white try? Um, is my microphone working now? Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you, Eric, yes. Um, yeah. the move that I keep gravitating towards is knight g5. Knight g5. Well, that's yeah, a pretty big threat. All right. So we got a couple of votes for knight g5. Yeah, threatening the fork. A classic fork. You see this all the time. Classic. That's like the first tactic you learn, right? Well, all right. Since uh, so many people seem to love that move, what would black respond with? I think uh, probably king g8, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then can't you say bishop h7 check? You could give a little check there. You could give a little check. Can you go yeah. knight e5 instead of g5 to attack the knight as well as the fork? Well, that's an interesting candidate move as well. Although it would allow the trade. You know, if you play knight e5, that, that will be traded away if black wants. But uh, going back to this bishop h7 variation like this, maybe a king f8, right? Probably. Mm hmm so that was a couple forcing moves in a row. But okay, I don't think bishop h7 really helped. I mean, what was the point? 
the, is the bishop good on h7? I would say certainly not. If anything, it's a problem because it's so almost trapped there. Knight g5 is the right first move. But there's a sort of a little tricky forcing move here after king g8. Yeah, white has uh, of several forcing options here. Uh, we saw the check, a couple of captures. Is it bishop e6? Bishop e6. No, that's Threatening work. the knight and the f pawn, but f takes seems to be sufficient for black. For some reason I thought the king was on f8, and if they take, it's a fork. What's funny is you have the right idea, you just got to uh, use the other piece. Knight e6, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Because the king's on g8, knight e6 x-clam, that's a candidate move if I've ever seen one. I mean, it hits, it's a fork, and there's a little tactical trick involved as well. With one of these. So, this it just wins a pawn, at least, no matter what. You'll notice that white started the, this position, white started a pawn down, white has three pawns to four. But white does have the bishop pair. So if we win back a pawn, we'll have that clean advantage, that bishop pair for free. Which is what happens. I mean, there's no, this is the best thing black can do anyway. Might as well take it. Check takes, takes, takes. Now, you might be tempted to end the analysis here and claim that white has a serious advantage, maybe perhaps even enough to win. Uh, but I wouldn't be so hasty because black actually has a tactical trick here to rob white of the bishop pair. By force, black has a forcing move to trade away one of white's bishops by force. I keep saying force, but you know, it's, don't, uh, you're not, he's not going to do it all, you know, by accident or, or with, with uh, helping you, you know. You, you got to force him to, to trade away the bishop. So what, is, what forcing move is black going to play? To take the bishop, otherwise the fork on e3, knight. Uh... Well, but it's Black's turn here, right? Yeah, so knight e5. Knight e5, exactly right. Knight e5. Yeah, if the fork on d3, I see you. Yeah, the fork on d3, oh, did I not exactly. D3? Okay. Right. Oh, maybe you did. I, oh, I mean, all the letters sound the same, so <laughs> it's kind of tough. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Knight e5, threatening the fork and threatening the bishop. So. Even though both of black's pieces are hanging, so are both of white's. It's kind of funny how that works out. All four pieces are hanging here. And of course, if white takes the knight and you take the bishop with black, then it's going to be opposite colored bishops with equal pawns. Virtually no winning chances at a high level there. So the best try is going to be to take the bishop, let him take our bishop because we didn't have a choice. And we're left in this position where white has a serious advantage. It's uh, bishop against knight, which is good for the bishop in this case, especially because there are pawns on both sides of the board. And so white's going to create a pass pawn on the king side. Black's going, going to either lose the pawns, maybe because white's king is so advanced, or try to trade them off on the queen side. And white's bishop can influence both of both sectors of the board, where the knight is, I mean, the knight's poorly placed to begin with, but he can only do one thing at a time anyway. Uh, I looked with an engine, it said it was about a little bit less than a pawn advantage for white, which honestly uh, didn't really answer any questions for me. Like that could still be winning uh, or a draw. You know, it just depends. I would guess like, you know, just a guess that it's probably a draw with perfect play. If both sides play absolutely perfect every move, I would imagine it's probably a draw, most likely. But in practice, white has really good winning chances. And uh, if white knows how to press, black is going to be suffering for a long time. 
his king is worse, his minor piece is worse, and there's a majority to deal with as well on the king side. Um, but yeah, this was the best play from the from the starting position. This is the best that white can do. You know, as as I said at the start, you know, we had we were, we had a pawn deficit, and this just wins back the pawn, seemingly keeping the bishop pair advantage, but not quite because of knight e five, and just having this this end game advantage here. Uh, but again, none of this happened in this game. <laughs> for the record, this was all analysis. Um, that, that didn't happen in, in the Galashvili game, Galashvili against Golden. From uh, let, let me check my notes here. What, what year was that game? Uh, was, uh, 2011. 2011. But, all right, so I guess that was all pretty clear cut. I would imagine no questions about that one. So I'll just move on to the next game. We won't save. Right, here we go. Yeah, this is uh, Magnus against Aronian from the 2013 Singfield Cup. This was the last game that Magnus played before his match against Anand, which who you know he obviously won that match and became world champion in 2013. So this was basically his last game as not a world champion uh, until he doesn't be, you know loses the title and isn't world champion again. <laughs> then he'll have more games, I guess. But, all right, so he has white here against Aronian. And I remember watching this game live. It, it definitely made an impression on me. And I had to include it in this, uh, in, in this lecture. Uh, all I want you to do right now is analyze one move for white. See, I'm a pretty nice lecturer, right? <laughs> I'll just give you one move. All you got to do is analyze that one move. Knight c4. So tell me what you think about that. I mean, it looks like the critical move is why I mentioned it. Seems like black can't take it takes the rook to that. I see what you're saying. So knight c4, bc. I don't see where that rook's going to go. Oh, why not backwards? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See the retreating Always retreat. <laughs> A fine gold rule. Well, if they traded, couldn't knight go to, I think that's c5 and fork the pawns? Once the uh, rook moves rook back? Backs, like backs up, yeah. Well, knight c5 wouldn't really fork the pawns because, uh, like, this pawn's defended. Yeah. So you know, you're not you're threatening to take it. Pawn, I don't know. Yeah, that's true, but you can even just take the other pawn. You don't have to attack it with the knight. The, the rook could take it. Oh, yeah. And this is what I would consider to be the main line, what you guys are talking about. It's knight c4 takes it and back it up. Give me the pawn. I, why can't it go back just one square? Ah, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. To protect the pawn, right? Yeah. Let's analyze that. Knight c4 takes, takes, rook b6. What would white play after rook b6? I think uh, c5 c is forked. Yeah. c5 fork. Yes, another classic tactic. Forking the two rooks. Very good stuff. So he would have to go all the way back, or I guess at least back to b7, but let's just say for posterity's sake he goes all the way back. And then we'll take the pawn, right? Does black have any sort of forcing move in that position? Otherwise, we do it, right? Free paw, and I'll take it.
What do you guys think? Any uh, any forcing move for black after rook takes a6? I'm thinking knight d4. It doesn't really make a threat, though. Well, aren't you, like, I'm defending it with my rook on a2. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The knight's gone. I don't know if it works, but the only move that I found that looked decent was d3 after all of that. That's where the rook goes back to d3, and then if take take, knight is pinned yes. on it twice. Yes, exactly right. This is exactly right. b3 is the key move there. Let's look at this variation. Knight, very good to spot that b3 move and to understand that the knight is the problem at the end. Like we mentioned, rook b6 gets forked by c5. So going back is correct. And b3 is the key move. x -clam. Hitting the rook too, so you can't just ignore it. We'll take it and take here. And white is sort of lucky actually not to lose this really. King e2 is the only move, according to the engine. And uh, knight d4 check, king e3 is the only move, as it were. But black doesn't really have better than, for example, repeating. Also, maybe knight c2 check is playable too, I remember. But anyways, whether white is uh, losing or not is not relevant because we just don't have to do this with white. right? We don't have to go into that and then hope we're not losing. We could do nothing and that's better. But the fact of the matter is knight c4 doesn't quite work yet. However, the world champion finds a very nice preparatory move. He plays rook a1, double x clam. But now we know why. Now we know why. b3 in that variation won't hit the rook. b3 won't hit the rook. And so that variation is not uh, really playable if knight c4 is going for white. Black can't try to defend in that way with the b3 counterattack. It won't hit a2 with a tempo. So Aronian does well to prevent knight c4 here, like rook d4, tries, at least tries to prevent knight c4, right? That's probably the best move, although he actually blundered it, or at least he's probably still, I mean, either way his position is not great, is what I'm trying to say. But king d8 just allows knight c4. Rook d4 at least, knight c4 is not playable. Even though we still get the a pawn, I'm taking all of your c pawns, and black is just clearly winning. He has two connected pass pawns, he's ahead two connected pass pawns, and is even threatening, well, not really threatening g2, I guess, because the knight's hanging. But anyways, obviously black is winning, <laughs> no matter how you slice it. Um, not that white would play knight c4, of course. White would just do anything. g3 is a good move. You know, I like g3. g3, f4 is an interesting idea. Uh, or even you could try to play like rook g1, g4, gh, you know, and get the rook in on the g file. Rook g1, g4, gh, get the rook in on the g file here. That's an interesting, I mean, why could do anything, right? He's, he's not forced to, to, uh, to the knight c4 plan. But if you're gonna let him do it, then he'll do it. He'll do it to it. Yeah, and he goes back all the way. Again, rook b6 is c5, like we mentioned. And what's nice here is that he can hit the rook away and take on a6. Now the knight on a6 is hanging. And like we mentioned, there's no b3 hitting the rook counterplay here. That would be the move. If the rook was still on a2, b3 would get it done with a tempo. But, well, he still did it, yeah. He just found nothing better. This loses a piece and the game. Knight d4, it doesn't really uh, save the position. Uh, there's more than one good move here. Even rook c1 is okay, which is kind of passive. Rook a8 was the engine suggestion. It plays as vigorously as possible. Uh, one nice point here is that if he tries to take your pawn and, and uh, 
take your rook here, the, the knight on a1 is, is hopelessly trapped. So that's not really working out for black. But yeah, that's not the only way for white to win after knight d4 even. But okay, he played b3. And we can admire the world champion's technique. Yeah, this is a nice move. Rook d1, knight takes c2, defends the rook. Right? <laughs> Pretty nice. So he just cleans it up. I mean, there are some st little problems, right? But he escapes the pin, and I mean, he could do basically anything normal to win. So he took it. Yeah, not resigning? Come on. Okay. Stopping rook f2 check, so finally he resigns. But okay, he's been down a piece for a while, so he could have resigned. But yeah, the the tactics all at the starting position here. This preparatory move, of course, Magnus calculated this stuff when he's playing rook a1. He knew that even if we play, for example, c5 here and takes, well, here we have king b7. All right, this is an interesting variation. King b7 defends the knight. And, uh, well, you could play rook a4 to hit the b-pawn. Then he has to just go back, right, because he has to defend. That's the only way to defend the pawn, you know. I mean, even here, white is, is doing well. Even here, white is doing well. But the way the game went, he just was winning, you know. Rook a1, double exclam, gets out of the way of b3 in that variation. And even when he tried it, as we saw, he just lost the knight because he can't play pawn takes rook, of course. There's no rook on a2. So really nice preparatory move there, all based on those tactics. And that's something that like really gets lost in a lot of high-rated player games. You know, when you see super GMs play, a lot of times they make maneuvers that you're like, okay, that move makes sense. You know, he puts this piece on a better square. But there might have been a subtle tactical reason for it. And sometimes you have to dig deep in, in and, and find it. But I like to uncover those little ideas. You know, it makes me feel like I learned something, even if I don't really <laughs> put it into play in my own game. I must have learned something, right? <laughs> but all right, let's look at the next one, huh? It's another Magnus example. Double Magnus. Double Magnus Monday. Although it's Wednesday. This was a game he played against uh, one of my favorites, David Navarra. I do love David Navarra. Um, he's a very exciting player. Uh, here, Magnus again, he's got rook at knight, sort of like in the last game. Uh, but his opponent has a whole queen. Luckily, Magnus also has a pawn, so he's no worse. Uh, rook, knight, and four pawns against queen and three pawns. Should be, that should be about equal materially. But I would say that if anybody has winning chances, uh, it's going to be white. He's got a uh, really safe king, and the queen can't win without, like, checkmate. You can't really break white down, is my point. You know, you can't really break white down. It's up for white to, can white win or not? Right now, if you turn on an engine, it just says zero, which indicates to me that should be a draw. <laughs> but I would say that that's not a fair evaluation. Obviously, white's better. Anybody would rather have white here. Check like this. Okay, so uh, Navarro's making sure that he's keeping an eye on the A pawn. So that ties down your rook. And he's also pinning the knight on F1, which is nice. So he gets out of the pin. He wants to include the knight, of course. But now Navarra makes a uh, positional weakening here. He goes for g5, which uh, doesn't really hurt the engine evaluation. But I, I would say it's, it's a pretty dubious move. I mean, he doesn't need to move the pawns. And it doesn't really help him to move the pawns. So I don't really know why he did it. I'm sure he had a reason. I just couldn't figure out why. 
And in fact, uh, you know, g5, it weakens his h pawn, which Magnus just goes and takes it. I'll show you what I mean here. Yeah, g, g4, okay. Knight e4. And after queen c1, Magnus played a, a tactic, <laughs> you could call it. But, you know, I thought it'd be pretty easy for you guys. Maybe you can still guess it just for fun. That is a possibility, but we can actually defend against that with a tactic of our own. Working the king and the pawn? With the knight? Oh, yes, yes, Jackson, yes. Knight f6 is, is the correct answer. Check. That's what he did, as we'll see. But I was mentioning rook d5. I was thinking we could probably play queen c6 get a little pin action going on all your pieces on the white squares. It seems like that would work. You could play a funny move there like king h2, and then queen takes rook knight f6 check. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, just get out of the pin, and then if he takes here, fork, right? <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. But, uh, well, he doesn't have to lose the rook on purpose. In fact, you can't take the pawns if I just keep my queen here, because you're... Your, your knight would be hanging then. But yeah, anyways, knight f6 check obviously just takes the pawn. Now, he could have uh, he could have prevented that with, like, king g7. I don't want you to think, by the way, that Navarra missed knight f6 check. That's unlikely. I think it's more likely that he was concerned about losing his a5 pawn with knight c5 trying to collect on the queen side. For example, like this. But this is actually a nice maneuver, the, this engine line here, queen a2 to e2. Here's the idea. If you go gobbling on the a-file, you're actually losing with white. The tactics are going to start working out for black in this kingside attack. h4. Threatening h3, which would win. So takes, but now we can still win tactically here. Check, and g3, winning. Because if you play to take here, which is, I would imagine, the only normal move, then we'll take and then we'll check you, and we get the fork on e3 no matter where you go to win, uh, win the rook and, of course, the game. So the moral of the story is, if he goes running over to the, king's, the queen side, then his king side's weak. Who would have thought? Uh, but you have to find some nice ideas to be confident in that with black. Uh, one problem for black is if you just try to defend the pawn with like queen e1, I can attack it twice because I've got two things. And anyways, like we were saying, rook d5 will, um, will be an, an option also. Uh, that's if your queen's on e1, because you can't play queen c6, as was previously mentioned. So he plays queen c1 and just lets the pawn drop. But like I was mentioning earlier, like you didn't have to play g5, g4, and, lo and loosen the pawn for him, you know. Even here, the computer still says it's equal. But that's obviously wrong. You know, white's better here. Check. Check. Also check. Okay, maneuvering around a bit. He wants rook f4. That's why he got his knight off of f4. Rook f4 defends. He only has two weak pawns on f2 and, and a4, and, and f4 defends them both. Okay. Now again... A small inaccuracy by Navarra. But you have to be really careful with the rook and knight hovering around your king. There are a lot of tactical opportunities. Right? Like he's trying to play, for example, rook f4 check, rook f5 check takes a5. Um, so a smart option for Navarra would be to sort of like 
hide his king away from all that. King h6, for example, and even to h7. Get out of the way of knight checks for, I mean, the, it's, a, it's four squares away, right? When the knight has a hard time going two squares diagonally, it takes four moves to, to move there. So it'll take three to check him, for example. And so there won't be immediate tactical tricks. And this would be really nice to have a safe king. And his queen defends g4. Still, it seems pretty precarious, right? The guy's got two weak pawns, and white is so solid. Uh, but even here, the engine says equal. A ridiculous evaluation still. Of course, white's significantly better here. But he goes for queen c2. Also, somewhat of a good-looking move. Right, touching the f pawn and the a pawn. Knight f4, knight f5, of course. Queen d3, that's a mistake. Queen d1, this is a nice square for the queen on g4 and on a4. Now he could still play the move knight d4. Again, this is what I was talking about. You can't take here because of a tactical trick. So this is why it would be better if the king was on h7. The knight wouldn't be afforded this maneuver, which this maneuver could be good for white to collect the a-pawn. Don't forget the queen has to defend both, both pawns. It can't really do that at the same time as, it, as things stand. So this is actually some trouble still. Um, yeah, king h6 to avoid that, for example, like this. But this holds steady for now. You're right, it defended the a-pawn with the tempo, so you don't have time to take on g4. And if you just move your knight back, uh, I can, for example, defend my g-pawn in multiple ways. Queen d7, king, king h5, etc. Mainly, etc. Okay, but queen d3, there's a small problem that you're not hitting the a-pawn. You're not touching the a4-pawn anymore. And this enables white's next move to make progress. White actually starts making concrete progress here, does Magnus. What's the impor important key move here for white to play? The e4. Very good. Very good stuff. e4. That's right. I mean, he's got a pass pawn. Let's push it, right? Let's push that pass pawn. This also enables knight e3 to take the g pawn as a potential idea. This wouldn't have been played if the queen's on d1, of course, because queen takes a4. Wouldn't, it wouldn't be worth it for white to lose the a pawn and give black a pass pawn, too. So. Yeah, this is a big mistake by Navarra to allow this. He's already pretty close to losing, if not lost. I think I actually did give that he's already lost here. Yeah. I noticed that, you know, when I analyze this game, the stronger the engines are that I use, the more lost it says black is. <laughs> yeah, because when I analyzed this three years ago, I remember the, it was like close to not losing. But now when I looked at it just today with Stockfish, it says like something plus three or something. It's already like pretty much dead lost, you know. Well, I guess not dead lost, but certainly lost. He goes for queen d7. Probably the best idea is to run the king in front. Um, I remember when I analyzed this years ago, I actually thought this might not be losing, but like I said, the engine evaluation is so high. And wouldn't you just generally imagine a rook and knight and three pawns, three connected pass pawns, are going to beat the queen? You know, queen's not that good. <laughs> it's pretty good, but come on. Rook, knight, and three pawns. Yeah, there is a trick here, though. e6 is a blunder, right? Got to always watch out for these tactics. That's what this whole lecture is about. Tactics such as this. So... Yeah, I did some ring around the rosy, I remember, like this, and then I played here. And then this is actually the same position if rook f6 check king e7. 
<laughs> so I couldn't exactly make progress, but of course white can bring up the pawns with the king and try to win gradually. It'll take a long time, it's a lot of effort to win this position, especially against somebody as strong as Navarra. He's gonna find some tricks. He's gonna fork you with his queen if you're not paying attention. He'll give you a perpetual check if you walk into it. So you have to be cautious about that stuff. But like I said, rook, knight, and three pawns, connected past pawns. It was shocking if it wouldn't win. Almost, you know, I would say virtually 100% sure it wins with perfect play. And that's not just because it's a virtual class, you know. But okay, so e4, uh, he, he played, instead of running the king back, king f6 would be a similar idea. Uh, he played queen d7, which actually allows him to just play up with e5 right away, protecting his a-pawn. And of course we have to calculate what if black gives back the queen here on f5. But white's already collected enough pawns that that's going to be a winning king and pawn end game. Just simple play, f4. Either way, you know, you can't let me have a protected pass pawn, right? But taking and king takes is going to be very similar to the game, actually. It might even be the exact same position as in the game. Um, he played, like this, obviously you don't do that on purpose with black, that would be ridiculous. You don't give your opponent a winning king and pawn in game out of the kindness of your heart, you know. He goes here. Right, this uh, allows him to, allows Magnus to make the trade as we saw previously by force. A queen b1 check is maybe a better try, something like this. But uh, it should lose in the long term anyway. Yeah, it gave a sample variation here. That was to avoid knight f5, knight f7 check winning the queen. Yeah, there's tactics everywhere when it's rook and knight. Yeah, here, this is the winning idea, I'll just tell you right now. It's to go here, easy. Because if you take it and I go to d7, you're done. You're done for. So, yeah. But okay, there's a hundred ways to win. You know, it just takes a long time. He goes for queen e6, and let's see if uh, somebody can chime in with the, the proper way to force the exchange. I think it's rook f5 check, because then the king has to go on the same rank. Right? Exactly right, Eric. Exactly right. Rook f5 check, as was played. And like you said, if the king goes back uh, to the 6th rank, it's just going to be rook f6 check, which would uh, win the, the queen for just the rook, only the rook. So he, he took just because that's better, you know. But like I said, we actually get the exact same position as we saw previously, where he played a couple moves here and then resigned. Yeah, king e3 resigns. I mean, we can click through it just for fun. But now we're done. You know, just don't let him get here. Did he not resign because if you actually try to push the G-pawn, wouldn't it be a fall? Because then maybe the king has time to make it to A8 at the end? Oh, well, like if you do, I think if you could still go for a while and do that, though. Yeah, I think if you go... You know, like, for example, if I still do this, then I'm still going to win, probably. No, no, I don't. Not yet. Yeah, this is a draw. That's a draw if I get to C8. I think that's why he waited for King. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, G4 is a draw. Yeah, G4 is a draw. Exactly right. That, that is an important point. Although not really a tactic, so I didn't analyze it. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, So, but King E3 wins, and then, and then he resigned. Yeah, you're right. Navarro picked the perfect time to resign. Yeah, he's real. That's I told, that's why I like him. He knows exactly when to resign. Never too early or too late. Um, but yeah, this was a nice game by Magnus. There were a lot of little tactics there, um, and some things that didn't happen over the board. But there were other tactical variations. Uh, but that's what you get, of course, with the rook and knight endgame um, against the queen. You could even argue it's not an endgame, but it seems like to me it's not too much material. 
But anyways, let's go on to the next one, huh? Let's see, we probably only have time for one more. And I have two more. But we'll just look at the next one. I think it's better. Maybe. It's close. They're both pretty good. All right, let me flip it. There we go. So this is uh, actually from the same tournament as that Magnus game we just looked at uh, from Beal 2018. And uh, this was uh, Svidler against Fashir Lagrave. Definitely two fan favorites. Here, uh, after a, an unusual opening where both sides kind of played uh, suboptimally, but you know, still is, is complicated, so I can't blame them too much. Uh, White finds himself in definitely a better position. Uh, it's White's turn. He's got uh, a very nice h6 pawn, a very nice h6 pawn indeed, and a better pawn structure to boot, and no, no problems at all. Svidler decides to change the structure with the move e5, which is uh, just kind of a poor decision. He doesn't need to do that. Any normal move, I gave two examples, rook c2 and king e2, are both totally fine. Uh, just improving the position. e5, question mark. Okay, sort of going for some tactics here, right? Rook e1, getting the pin. Never do this. And then f4, attacking the center. Uh, now Vashir Lagrav, he has a comfortable position here, and his move's not terrible, but he does miss the most precise idea. Uh, or maybe, you know, missing it's kind of, maybe he saw it but didn't want it. Uh, but I was hoping you could find a good forcing move for black. But don't say e takes f4, come on. <laughs> I feel like rook f8 is the only move where you even have a chance of holding on to the pawn. Rook f8 is what was played, although that didn't fill my criteria of a forcing move. Oh, yeah. It doesn't threaten anything. But the idea is clear. If you take on e5, you, you want to take back with the check so you can try to defend your pawn. Any other forcing suggestion? I mean, there's not too many forcing moves available, as far as I can see. Couldn't even find one at first. Wait, yeah, b5, right? I mean, you got no checks, no captures. b5. It's like the only threat. Yeah, that's a key move. Now, it's kind of difficult to see why that would help. If anything, it looks like it might hurt. It's a pretty loose move. You're even putting a pawn on a white square, so strategically, that's not correct. Uh, but... It sort of forces uh, Sophie's choice here for the bishop. It has to uh, weaken something, either the d3 pawn or the c file. Um, for example, I looked at both options, like bishop b3. Uh, this controls c2, so we can't play rook c8 to c2. But like I said, it weakens the d pawn. Now we're going to lose our e pawn no matter what, and there's no way that that Vashir Lagrav could save that pawn that that Svidler temporarily sacrificed with e5. But certainly white's worse here. You know, the situation on the d-file is favorable to black to begin with because the pawn is on a dark square for black and a white square for white. But also black's king is better, and even the h-pawn can be a liability now. For example, in this variation here, black threatens rook takes e1, where both the king and rook taking would lose a pawn, the h or d pawns. So, I mean, white can avoid this by giving up the e-file. I don't think white's close to lost here or anything, 
But he's definitely under some pressure. He should be worse. And um, well, White should have been better, like at the start of the, you know, the position that before he sacked the pawn on e5, temporary sacrifice. Um, also possible instead of bishop b3 is bishop d5. But this gives up the c2 square. It's faster, it's a tempo faster, but it gives up the c2 square. Still do the same maneuver here, and rook c2 is, is imminent. Um, and also d3 is even weak here. So, I mean, either way, white's not doing too badly or anything, but it's black that has the advantage in, in the initiative here, just giving back the pawn and uh, playing on the queen side for rook c2 or playing against the d-pawn. That's how, that's how you would do it. Uh, but Vashir Lagrav, he did try to keep the pawn with rook f8. Like you were saying, because now if f e, f e, check will be the response. So he, but he just gets the king out of the way, simply. And you still can't defend the pawn. He's still going to take it twice. So Vashir Lagrav understood that, just moved his king up, because that's what you do in the endgame. And here he makes an interesting decision. He pushes past. That's a double-edged move. It's not the only move, but it shows that Vashir Lagrav is still playing for the win here. He gives white a passed pawn, basically, on e5. Uh, and in return, he has two against one on the g and f file. He has g and f against his g pawn, so he can try to make a passed pawn by breaking on f3, by playing g4, f3. So that's a double-edged move, and I like to see it. And that's why we like Vashir Lagrav. Uh, Svidler, also an, uh, an interesting positional player in his own right, lifts the rook, rook h4, hitting the d-pawn, and f4. So that's another benefit of f5. He gets to block with f4. But there's a, a forcing move that you'd have to calculate here, and Svidler actually does end up playing it. It's a fork, a simple fork. What do you think? What fork could White attempt? Rook e4. Rook e fork. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. That is what he played. It is a mistake, though, as we'll calculate, as we'll see. Uh, Vashir Lagrav really figured this position out. Um, he has other options. e6 is like an interesting move. I didn't really analyze it. I, I wouldn't be the first move I'd play. Uh, because, you know, forcing bishop c6 uh, wouldn't be logical to me. But I think that most people would also consider bishop d5 as a move here to attack the b-pawn and, and, and stop bishop c6, you know. Well, I guess not really stop it, but I don't think white uh, would mind a bishop trade, especially uh, if you're going to get a backward c-pawn there. So rook c8, I think it's smart to just give it up and play rook c2, right? Get that rook in there. This would be a reason not to play bishop d5, because my bishop was previously stopping the rook from infiltrating. So Svidler could have thought, okay, bishop d5, it gets the guy's rook to c2. I don't really think it's worth the pawn, because he's going he's gonna to start going Pac-Man on me on the second rank, you know. But uh, even still, the computer says this is pretty unclear. You'd have to do a lot more analysis during a game to be sure about what's really happening here. But minimum, white could like give back the b-pawn and play bishop back to d5 to defend the a2-pawn. Something like this. And continue playing like with e6, or as in the game with rook e4, under more favorable circumstances. But he went rook e4 at once. Okay, g5. Svidler saw that coming, though. He knew he could attack my rook and defend his pawn. I'll just move my rook, and now he's got two pawns hanging. But Vashir Lagrav can defend and attack. That's a great way to fight for the initiative. He defends his g-pawn, and he puts pressure on the e-pawn. So in case you take here, he can take this one. Now, it's pretty clear that white actually is not going to win material in any way. And uh, also, not only that, but his rook on h5 is, is woefully misplaced. You know, you'd rather it be, you know, I mean, anywhere, right? The rook on h5 just is totally out of play. And it's difficult to even play rook h3 because of g4. 
No, this didn't work out for White. Svidler tries to make it work. Uh, maybe he was even anticipating this position, actually, and wanted to play g4. Although, to me, it looks a little desperate. It seems like he found himself in this position, and, and then he's like, uh-oh, let me try g4, you know? <laughs> that kind of a deal. We've all been there. It didn't work out like we thought, so let's try to muddy the waters a bit. Um, but he could try to take... Uh, again, this isn't a great trade or anything. He got rid of his past e-pawn, and... You know, he has a past d3 pawn, but that's much less potent than the e-pawn could have been. For example, something like this to try to excavate the rook from the h-file, right? Because the, the g-pawn's hanging. But we'll keep it trapped there, even though it gives up the b-pawn. That's okay, because we can win that back. Even though he's trying to win our h-pawn, yeah, we'll just prevent that first of all. And um, this is another example. When I analyzed this game in 2018, um, it was not clear if black was winning or not, but I put it on the computer now. It gives a much higher evaluation for black. Uh, the rook is, is still terrible on h5, and this is like the worst thing that when you have a bad piece like this and all the other pieces come off the board and you're left with the stupid piece. This happened to me once against uh, Georg Meyer. I had a knight on b6. It couldn't even hardly move. He had like b3, c4, you know? And I had a knight on b6 just stuck there. I played like, you know, some really clumsy maneuver, and he had a great bishop too. He's just crushing me, God. And then all the other pieces were traded, so... Yeah, I got crushed in, in, in much the same way. Um, but anyway, so this should probably be lost with best play, but still a lot of work to do. I mean, he still has to win back some pawns. But of course, with the rook on h5 so out of play, there's no way that the black rook wouldn't be able to win the queenside pawns. Um, so Svidler doesn't go for rook takes d4. He doesn't want to trade those pawns. Maybe he calculated even the exact variation I gave because it's all pretty forcing. That's possible. Um, instead, he played g4, like I said. Like I mentioned, this is probably just a desperate attempt. You wouldn't imagine that it, it's too... You wouldn't be too confident in it, I would say. En passant. Of course, Vachir Lagrave, he's French, so he's going to know en passant. Right? I mean, what can he do? Rook g4. Yeah, doubling. This is actually x-clan, by the way. Doubling rooks. I think it's the only winning move. This just sets up tactical threats against white's king that are insurmountable. He took this, and we'll see how the game... It ended quite abruptly. Check. Check. He resigns. He just resigned. Now, I was mentioning how Navarra, he, we, he picked the perfect time to resign, as Eric pointed out. That was the perfect time to resign. Um, Svidler is, is known as an early resigner, but, but we will excuse him this time. It's still a little early, <laughs> but he is dead lost. I gave the variations here. Uh, just for example, we can get the scenario where his king is on g2. He has to walk into a discovered attack. It's his only legal move. And then we're just going to have our, our way with him. It's, this is like sort of a windmill here. Uh, check this out. This is a funny variation. Check. Discovered check, right? Here. Now, if you block with the bishop, rook h2 check is going to win material. Skewering the king and bishop. Um, and you can't block with rook g2, of course, because we have bishop on c6 covering that square. So bishop e2 is not going to get it done. But if we go back here, check this out. Check, only legal move king f4. Check, only legal move king g3. And then we're back where we started, except I took your d pawn. Yeah, the craziest kind, it's like a sort of makeshift windmill here. Now, rook b3 check is mate in like 12 or something, according to the engine. But I would play rook c3 check and take the guy's bishop. I don't calculate till mate in 12. I take the free bishop. And so, uh, well, anyways, I don't know how much Fiddler looked into this before resigning. You know, you could even just get to this position and not, not bear it, right? You can't really, can't really hope to like, okay, I'll play king g2 and I'll survive this. It's unlikely. <laughs> Pretty unlikely. So yeah, very interesting game. A lot of little tactics there. Um, like I said, most of these examples, they had more pieces on the board than the typical endgame. Uh, sort of, you know, middle game slash endgame. But tactics are extremely important, as always. Um, there's even a famous saying, I think it was uh, Teichmann, uh, that he said that chess is 99% tactics. 
but it might have been Richard Reddy. So they're both named Richard, so I get a little confused. Well, one of them said that. <laughs> and uh, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, right? Uh, obviously, you know, on move one, for example, you're not calculating any tactics. There are no tactics. So a lot of times there's positions where there aren't forcing moves that, that are necessary to calculate or, or important. Uh, but when they are important, they're the most important. They're more important than anything. So, you know, they're, they're weighted 99%, I guess, but not always, you know, not always in the position. And a lot of people think, like in an endgame, that there are less tactics, which is somewhat true. But still, we saw these endgames were loaded with tactics. And uh, hopefully, if you find yourself in, in the situation, you won't make the mistake of thinking that it's, it's so calm. You have to always be looking at forcing moves, all your checks, captures, and threats all the time. It's something I tell all my students, and I'm sure most coaches do. But anyways, that's all I had for you today. If you enjoyed, please consider to leave a like and subscribe to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta's YouTube. Thanks. Bye-bye.